This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Stocks tumble. Investors on edge one day before the key employment report on a lack of a resolution in Greece and the recent rout in the bond market. Game of chicken. OPEC meets tomorrow. And even with the world awash in oil, many expect the cartel's standoff with the West to continue. Bottoms up. Why the bourbon industry is quickly becoming an economic force in the state of Kentucky. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, June 4th. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. A big sell-off on Wall Street this day, and it wasn't just one thing that caused investors to ditch stocks, but a little bit of everything. Lack of a resolution in Greece. What will the country pay, and when will they pay it? Concerns over the recent move higher in interest rates, and it's been a big one, and a drop today in oil prices. By the close, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was off 170 points to finish at 17,905. NASDAQ fell 40 points, and the S&P 500 was 18 points lower. As for interest rates, they took a bit of a breather with yields falling slightly after they hit a seven-month high. What investors really care about is the Fed and when the data-dependent central bank may move on rates. Today, the head of the International Monetary Fund said, not so fast. Christine Lagarde made it clear that she wants the Federal Reserve to delay raising rates until next year. And she's not alone. Other high-ranking officials are also expressing some concerns about moving too soon. Steve Leisman has more. The International Monetary Fund not mincing any words today in urging the Federal Reserve to hold off interest rate hikes until the first half of 2016. The IMF said the Fed should wait until wages and inflation start to rise. Muted inflation pressures suggest that interest rate hike can wait a little and that such interest rate hike would be better off in 2016. The comments are in line with remarks from some Fed officials, like Fed Governor Lael Brainerd, who in recent days said that the economic weakness may be not all temporary. She urged caution in rate hikes. And today, Fed Governor Dan Tarullo said the economy had lost momentum. Tarullo said he's uncertain about whether the weakness is just temporary. But he said there are more questions about the economy now than there were at this time last year. Fed officials have said they're looking at two criteria to hike rates. First, whether the job market is improving, and second, whether inflation is moving back towards the 2% target. But recent comments suggest there's a third criteria. Officials seem to be waiting to see if the economy can handle what they call rate normalization, or a consistent march higher in rates towards a 3 to 4% range. In fact, in a recent speech, Fed Chair Janet Yellen didn't even call it raising rates. She called it normalizing policy, as in more than one hike. I think it will be appropriate at some point this year to take the initial step to raise the federal funds rate target and begin the process of normalizing monetary policy. To support taking this step, though, I will need to see continued improvement in labor market conditions, and I will need to be reasonably confident that inflation will move back to 2 percent over the medium term. That explains why the Fed doesn't just do a quarter-point hike and wait. It's a bit like a plane inspector who doesn't just certify if the plane can fly at 5,000 feet. The inspector wants to know if the plane is capable of handling the cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. Likewise, the Fed is not just judging if the economy can handle liftoff. It's trying to figure out if the economy can handle rate normalization before it acts. That's a high bar and could lead to a policy mistake. The Fed staying too low for too long which some believe it already has. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. The Fed also, of course, paying very close attention to the labor market. And just today, we learned that jobless claims fell by 8,000 to a seasonally adjusted 276,000 last week, uh, near a 15-year low. That's a sign the job market remains firm. Tomorrow, the closely watched, highly anticipated government employment report for May will be released. Economists look for the creation of about 225,000 jobs last month, with the unemployment rate remaining at 5.4 percent. So let's turn now to Mohamed El Arian to talk more about tomorrow's highly anticipated jobs report and what the move higher in the bond market may mean for the Fed. He is the chief economic advisor with Allianz. Good to see you, Mohamed. Welcome back. Thank you, Sue. 
Let's start, first of all, with the jobs report. I also want to talk to you about the unusual move by the IMF today. But uh, as we are awaiting that jobs report, ideally, what would you like to see tomorrow? Ideally, I'd like to see three things. One is job creation in excess of 200,000 for the month. Two is higher wage growth above 2% annualized. And the third is some pickup in labor participation without a sharp increase in the unemployment rate. That is the dream team, if you like, mm -hmm. out of the report tomorrow, because that would point to a broadening economic recovery. Let's talk a little bit about the IMF's statement today. Christine Lagarde, there's been a lot of tut-tutting about this. Who are they to tell us uh, what to do with our, with our interest rates? What do you make of it? Was it all that unusual uh, for the IMF to speak out this way? Uh, what do we think? Yes, Tyler, it was unusual. And it was unusual because the IMF was extremely specific and explicit about a very delicate policy issue, which is when should the Fed rate high, raise interest rates. It is very unusual for, for them to be that specific. It is also unusual for them to say this when everybody acknowledges that there's tremendous fluidity in the economic data, that different series are, are giving different signals about what lies ahead. And finally, the Fed has worked really hard to reduce the market obsession about the timing of the first rate hike. What they want us to focus on is a very shallow path that is conditional, so they could stop, they could continue, and importantly, a terminal point that's lower than historical averages. So for the IMF to put back the timing front and center mm -hmm. is something that, of course, contributed to significant market volatility today. Does it also indicate that perhaps, perhaps Ms. Lagarde has concerns about whether the global economy can withstand a rate hike by the Fed? So I suspect three motivations. One is exactly what you just said, Sue, which is they want to bring in the international context. And it's not a very solid one. They're worried about Europe. They're worried about the emerging world. And they don't want a U.S. interest rate shock to derail the rest of the economy. So they want to bring in the international perspective. They've also been more assertive in the discussions with the European Union recently on Greece. They've taken a pretty tough position. And thirdly, they want to signal to the rest of the world that they are even-handed, that they are willing to speak to their largest shareholder the same way that they are speaking to smaller ones. So I think it's a combination of all three, Sue. So what's next for interest rates, Mohammed, and when? Best guess. So what's next for market interest rates is volatility, more volatility. U.S. rates are unusually driven by what's happening in Europe. Europe is being subjected to the impact of very large ECB large-scale purchases versus a change in paradigm about inflation. So the German interest rates was going to be very volatile. That is going to translate across the Atlantic to us. So the one thing for mm -hmm. sure is interest rate volatility, which is going to mean also foreign exchange volatility, commodity volatility, and, yes, equity volatility. In terms of what the Fed is likely to do, it's not just about employment and inflation. It's also about something that I want to talk about, which is how do you balance the risk of a policy mistake mm -hmm. versus the risk of a market accident? Right. And, and they're concerned about risk taking. They're concerned that artificial rates have led to asset allocations that are no longer consistent with fundamentals. And what they're going to do is they're going to try to normalize. So I still expect them to, to raise rates this year. All right. On that note, Mohammed. Always a pleasure to spend time with you. Mohamed el with Allianz. More on the situation in Greece at rattled markets today. That country said it won't make its payment to the IMF due tomorrow. The International Monetary Fund says Greece plans now to bundle four payments into a single one, 1 1.6 billion euro. That's a lump sum due on June 30th. Bundling is allowed under IMF rules but is rarely used. Oil prices dropped for a second day ahead of tomorrow's OPEC meeting. West Texas Intermediate fell nearly 3 percent to $58 a barrel. And despite concerns of a global supply glut, many investors expect OPEC to maintain current production levels. Jackie DeAngelis has more. The oil market awaiting tomorrow's OPEC meeting to see if it will cut production to stem the glut of oil flooding the market. According to an exclusive CNBC survey of prominent oil analysts, strategists and traders, the majority believe there will be no production cut at this time. 
but nearly half think that supply and demand dynamics are the key factor driving oil prices right now. We still have a lot of production in this country. We still don't have a lot of use for it yet. Although global demand looks like it's picking up a little bit, I think we come off a little bit after the OPEC meeting. Meantime, the supply glut grows. Saudi Arabia is at peak production. OPEC as a whole is producing over its 30 million barrel per day quota. And here in the United States, another production bump last week moves the needle closer to 9.6 million barrels per day. OPEC's goal in enduring low prices has been to squeeze out U.S. shale producers, but it hasn't been working, and as we know, production is rising. The survey respondents had no consensus on what they think about U.S. production. A third said they think it will rise, a third said it might flatline, and a third said they think it will fall. I think we are going to start seeing lower levels in crude oil. I also am looking at another thing that's coming into the market, and that's Iran. So we're going to have another supplier into the market along with OPEC producing, along with the U.S. producing. To cut or not to cut? That's the question for OPEC. Even if the cartel doesn't act now, about a quarter of those surveyed believe they will have to act next year, and thus the game of chicken continues. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. Still ahead, the federal government suffers a massive security breach. Details next. The FBI is investigating what some are calling one of the largest thefts of government data ever. A vast amount of information about federal employees held by the Office of Personnel Management was accessed. The government agency says four million people were affected by the breach, including current and former employees. According to the Associated Press, citing a U.S. official, the hack could potentially affect every single federal agency. U.S. officials reportedly suspect hackers based in China are behind the attack, but it's still being investigated. An update now on a story from last month. Securities regulators have sued a firm that calls itself PTG Capital and several others for allegedly making bogus takeover offers for Avon products and two other companies. The suit alleges that the fake uh, regulator, regulatory filings were attempts to fraudulently drive up the share price. Dish Network is reportedly in merger talks with T-Mobile. According to reports, the discussions are in the preliminary stages. Still, shares of both Dish and T-Mobile rose in trading today. A potential deal would be the latest in a string of consolidations happening in the industry. Julia Borston takes a look at the changing telecom landscape. If Dish Network and T-Mobile can agree to the terms of a deal, the combination of the fourth largest wireless carrier and the second largest satellite TV company would create a new giant in both communications and TV distribution, better positioned to face rivals. This comes as T-Mobile's rival AT&T gets bigger, closing in on its $49 billion acquisition of Dish rival DirecTV. And it sets the stage for more consolidation for other telecom giants. We think the market's becoming more competitive. AT&T's becoming more competitive with DirecTV. Timo could become more competitive with Dish and Sprint. And SoftBank have a lot of firepower and potential partnerships with cable and Google down the road. And we think that leaves Verizon in a very, very vulnerable position. Those satellite and telecom companies are teaming up as they look for more scale in the face of Charter and Time Warner Cable's deal. Distribution giants are working to grow their subscriber numbers as they adapt to the spike in mobile usage and digital content consumption. Analysts say a Dish T-Mobile marriage would speak to the two companies' strengths. Dish brings billions of dollars in wireless spectrum, T-Mobile, the cellular network, and fast-growing subscriber base. So I think T-Mobile, particularly with Dish, will have the opportunity to target the suburban and rural customer bases that today it doesn't address. And we think that's really where the revenue synergies could come from in such a transaction. The question for all the mergers in the works, regulatory approval. Though none of the ongoing deals should face as much opposition as Comcast and Time Warner Cable did. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Sales continue to slide at land's end, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The retailer reported a nearly 10 percent decline in first quarter revenue as the company continues to struggle with a weak retail environment and foreign currency impacts. Shares off 4.5 percent to 27.39. 
J.M. Smucker out with mixed results today. The food company behind brands like Folgers Coffee, Pillsbury, reported weak quarterlies and a disappointing outlook for full-year earnings. This as higher costs and shifts in consumer eating habits are weighing on performance there. Shares off almost 4% to 113.75. Navistar reported a decline in revenue even as cost cutting helped narrow its loss. The commercial vehicle company has been struggling to gain market share despite red hot demand for commercial trucks in North America. The shares tumbled 8% to 2482. Rite Aid saw same-store sales rise 2% in, in May, led by growth in its pharmacy section. But analysts were expecting a bigger increase, so shares fell nearly 4% to $8.34. The Fortune 500, it is the annual list of the 500 largest companies in America, and this year their combined annual revenue hit a record. In the top spot for the third year in a row is Walmart, ExxonMobil, number two, and fellow energy company Chevron came in at number three. Joining us now from Washington is a familiar face to all of us, Susie Garab, senior special correspondent at Fortune and an NBR contributor. Susie, welcome. Great as always to see. What is the significance of the Fortune 500? Why do investors care? Well, you know, first of all, just from the point that these are very iconic companies, this is, Tyler, like the Oscars, the Academy Awards for corporate America. So everybody's always looking, you know, who's number one. And as you said, it, it was it's Walmart. But also, these 500 companies, not only are they iconic and American household names, but they are the powerful engine of not only the U.S. economy, but also the global economy. And, and you just mentioned that their combined revenues hit a record. As a percentage of GDP, it's something like 72 percent. So they have huge economic clout. And that's significant at a time where we're always talking about startups and these right. uh, you know, jazzy companies and entrepreneurial companies out of Silicon Valley. So Susie, were there any surprises this time on the <laughs> list? Always. You know, it's interesting what happened if you look at the top 10. First of all, with all of the, you know, plunging oil prices that we've seen recently, fascinating that Exxon held on to its number two spot. And you mentioned Chevron and Phillips also in the top 10. But the other one that's kind of surprising is CVS. CVS Health is now in the top 10. Go figure. I mean, here this company has become a powerful player in healthcare. It stepped over AT&T and another energy company hmm. to get into the top 10. I know you spent a lot of your time these days talking to the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. There was also a survey that went along with this, the 60th iteration right. of it. What did the survey find? Well, the top question was what, to the big companies, what is the biggest threat that you're facing? And it's fascinating. It wasn't cybersecurity. That came in number two. It was technological change. Uh, rapid technological change is a, a big issue for big companies, and they say that they're going to change more in the next five years than in the past five years. Uh, separately, in terms of the questions that I've been asking CEOs, you know, we're fixated here in the media about what the Fed's going to do next. Most CEOs are pretty chill about it. Uh, uh, their feeling is, is if interest rates go up, it means that the U.S. economy is no longer in a crisis and that things are doing better. And overall, they're pretty positive about the economy, even though it's been struggling a bit. All right, Susie, great to see you. Great seeing both of you, too. Susie Garib in D.C. for us tonight. Coming up, the bourbon boom. Why some say this is the best time to be in the bourbon business since Prohibition. It is the worst outbreak of bird flu this country has ever seen. And now its impact is being felt beyond the farm and all the way to your local grocer. Morgan Brennan has more on the nation's egg shortage. Consumers are starting to feel the pinch from this year's record outbreak of bird flu. Well, I mean, shopping is more expensive. I'm going to probably go to a couple of stores before I make my decision and uh, buy certain product. Now it'll change what I have to eat. Grocery stores across the U.S. are beginning to notify customers that a national egg shortage is cutting into inventory levels and pushing retail egg prices higher. The USDA has now confirmed more than 200 cases of bird flu, affecting 45 million chickens and turkeys. The vast majority, egg-laying hens. Nearly 12 percent of the country's layer hen population is being put down. Commodity research firm Erner Berry says it's pushed egg prices to record levels. We're looking at about a 270% increase to egg product pricing um, in terms of the breaking egg cost. 
and now the egg processors have had to go out in the open market and compete for any and all shell eggs. According to Erner Berry, over the past six weeks, the wholesale price of a dozen Midwest large shell eggs, the kind consumers buy at the store, have risen 120 percent. Supermarkets are beginning to push that cost out to their customers. In New Jersey, one Wegmans grocery store has posted notices about the situation in its dairy and baked goods departments. Availability at some Lunds and Byerly's stores is limited due to shortages in the Twin Cities market. Restaurants are also beginning to feel the pain. Regional fast food chain Whataburger has had to curb its breakfast hours after its primary supplier became infected. McDonald's confirms that one of its suppliers was impacted as well, though contingency plans are preventing any disruptions. Other chains, including Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks and Dine Equity's IHOP, say they haven't been affected but are watching the situation closely, which experts warn may still get worse. We certainly didn't anticipate an outbreak that big. So it's, we are in, you know, going through uncharted world, waters now. But there have been winners, if reluctant to be called that. Analysts note top egg producer Cal Maine, whose operations are largely in the south and southwest, may benefit from increased demand, sending the stock soaring. Archer Daniels Midland says it's fielding more inquiries for the egg substitute products it manufactures, as is startup Hampton Creek. And earlier this week, the USDA greenlighted the importation of pasteurized egg products from the Netherlands to help companies make up for losses. For a Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. From eggs to bourbon. Kentucky bourbon, the industry growing fast, adding jobs, generating revenue for the state, leaving an economic mark on the local economy. Dominic Chu got the lucky assignment in Loretto, Kentucky. Welcome to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, home of America's native spirit. We're talking, of course, about bourbon whiskey. Now, it's not actually a requirement for bourbon to be from Kentucky, but for all intents and purposes, it is. 95% of the world's bourbon supply is made right here, and for good reason. The limestone water that we get from the ground is iron-free and clean. Uh, great water for making whiskey. We have about as many hot days as cold days during the course of a year which is perfect for the aging process of the barrels. In order for whiskey to be considered bourbon, a number of different requirements need to be satisfied. Among them, it needs to use a grain mix of at least 51% corn and be aged for a minimum of two years in new charred American white oak barrels. And of course, be made in the USA. Some industry insiders call this the best time to be in the bourbon business since prohibition. Thanks to booming demand, both domestically and abroad, production has been ramping up, and that's helping to give a boost to the local economy. According to the Kentucky Distillers Association, the number of distillers in the state tripled over the last two years, and nearly 7,000 additional jobs were created. We're drawing well over 100,000 visitors a year right here to Claremont to come visit our distillery, take a tour and see where Jim Beam's being made. Bourbon's run may continue to have legs as some industry watchers point to growing popularity among millennials. That might be one big reason why bourbon sales grow even as beer sales have stalled. 95% of the world's bourbon is made here in Kentucky. I think all the good bourbon's made here. I don't know where that other 5% comes from, but I wouldn't drink it. And just think about this. There are currently one million more barrels of bourbon aging in the state of Kentucky than there are people living in the state. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu, Loretto, Kentucky. I need to get busy on those barrels to uh, read more about the impact the bourbon industry is having on Kentucky and its economy. Head to our website, nbr.com. Wow, Dom got a great assignment. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that good was for him. really nice. Hope he brings some back. Oh, wouldn't that? That would actually be excellent. Yes. We'll see. We'll let you know. That does it for Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera, and we'd like to remind you that this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thank you for your support. Have a great evening, everybody, and we'll hope to find you right back here tomorrow night.